All right, well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Healthy Native Youth Community of Practice call. Um, our topic today is Two-Spirit LGBTQ Inclusion in the Community and in the Classroom. My name is Amanda Gaston. I am the host for your series. My pronouns are she and her, and I am from the Zuni Pueblo in New Mexico. Um, I have been with the Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board since 2012, and I have worked on projects like Native It's Your Game, which is a middle school sexual health curricula, and We Are Native, which is a multimedia health resource for Native youth, and then of course, um, Healthy Native Youth. So just a quick introduction before I pass it on to our guest speakers. Um, maybe we'll start with Mick. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Mick Rose. I am from the Diné, Omaha, and Pawnee tribes. My pronouns are they, them. I work at the Native American Youth and Family Center in Portland, Oregon. Um, and specifically within um, violence prevention for the Two-Spirit community. Thank you. Um, Bridget, do you want to introduce yourself next? Um, hello, everyone. My name is Bridget Valenzuela. I work with the Basquiaki Tribes Meth and Suicide Prevention Initiative, and I am Yoeme, or I, from the Basquiaki Nation in Arizona. And my pronoun, pronouns are she, her, Thank you. And how about Morgan? Hello, my name is Morgan Thomas. I'm a settler. I use they them pronouns and I am the Two-Spirit LGBTQ Outreach Coordinator at the Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board. Thanks for having me. Awesome. And Renee? Hi, um, my name is Renee Machaca. I am Enda and Yoeme and I work for NEA Family Center. I work for the Many Nations Academy as a cultural arts instructor. Thank you for having me. Oh, my pronouns, they, them. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> See, my arrow buttons never work. I, I can never figure this out. <laughs> All right, well, again, thank you all for being on the call. It's really nice to see some familiar names and then it uh, looks like maybe a couple new names on here too. So just a quick overview of what we'll be covering. Um, we've broken down what Two-Spirit LGBTQ inclusion might look like based off of your community's readiness level. And we're gonna start with a little background before we get into the different levels of readiness. Um, so level one, just getting started. Level two, we're getting there. Level three, let's celebrate. And we'll try to save a little bit of time um, for discussion at the end. So welcome again, everyone. Um, we love to know who is on the call. So if you would, um, please type in your name and your role, as well as your email address into the chat box. And you can find the chat box on your toolbar underneath the More tab. And if you want to send your email privately to me, that's cool too. Um, but we'll send updates um, for the community of practice reminders as well as the resources um, to folks too. And we love to have side conversations. So to get a conversation going, um, just curious how you are gauging your level of readiness in your community. If you want to start thinking about that and we can start that conversation on the side. And just to let folks know that if you are new to the session or you maybe missed previous sessions, you can go to the Healthy Native Youth website under the resources and support tab to find the previously recorded sessions as well as uh, the handouts there. And while people are doing that, um, I'll also let folks know that we will save the chat feed. So if there are questions that we don't get to during the call, we'll make sure to follow up uh, with folks afterwards, if you provide your email address. 
So I think we'll continue that conversation. And for the sake of time, we will uh, get started and we will pass it off to Mick. Hi, everybody. Um, again, my name is Mick Rose. I work at the Native American Youth and Family Center, um, specifically within violence prevention for the Two-Spirit and DigiQueer community. And something that um, we really wanted to think about is how to um, support, how, how to help our youth find support and acceptance within community. And there's a couple of points that I really want to hit, which is how to become a good accomplice and a health educator. Um, how to center our youth's hierarchy of needs and what it might look like for someone in the two-spirit LGBT community for all of those things to happen. Um, what we experience as two-spirit indigiqueer youth is typically family rejection. Um, the fallout of that uh, can manifest for our youth's lives in disparities such as houselessness, increased risky behavior with drugs and alcohol, risky sexual practices, domestic and partner violence, suicide and self-harm, et cetera, et cetera. And so when visualizing youth programming, really thinking about safety as a top priority as we center our participants' hierarchy of needs. And that first level really being the physiological, I um, don't know if we can click to the next slide. Um, and just, you know, ensuring that um, as participants come into our programming, the base level need is that they're going to need food. They're going to need shelter if they're experiencing houselessness. They're going to be able, um, need to be able to access um, doctors to get their, you know, their HRT and their PrEP. Um, the next level of need would be their safety. Are they safe in the home that they, you know, that they live in? Um, what is the community perception with two-spirit kids as they're meeting together um, and also within intergenerational groups? So is this group something that's visible? Um, for kids that are under 18, is that safe for them to say, hey, mom and dad, I'm going to, you know, the Two-Spirit um, Safe Space Alliance Club meeting? Or do we have to be a little bit more general with the titles and, and be a bit more ambiguous so that we can focus on community building and we take that, that um, pressure away from kids and we maintain their safety? Um, and then we're, we'll be able to get to that love and belonging in their, in their needs with building friendship and community, um, getting to beating groups and, and larger programming spaces where they're having club meetings and activities and really inspiring at that next level, esteem with um, self-esteem, recognition. Um, specifically for us, we really focus on um, the intergenerational learning, elder connection, viewing our gifts as two-spirit and indigenous people as sacred, and that way our youth can get to that self-actualization um, phase with self-advocacy. Um, something that I really, you know, think about um, as, we're, as we're assessing where each kid is at, and it's a, it's a lot of work to really get to that underlying story, but just to kind of hit home to to how important that is. Um, we have several youth in our programming and that are um, houseless. And one specifically that came to Naya about a year and a half ago was experiencing life in and out of a shelter and really not stable in lots of, lots of ways. Um, so the first thing that we did was set them up with a an housing advocate. And it took quite a while to get them to the point where they were in a group home. Um, moving out of that shelter life into a group home and um, finding a pathway to employment, helping them access insurance so they can, you know, they can access their um, hormone replacement um, therapy medication and just feeling stable in that for, you know, at least six months and um, before they actually started to show up regularly for groups. Every time they came, welcoming them in, introducing them to new to new community members so that they really felt connected, um, that, that they weren't just only connecting with one person in order to get their needs met, that we were also just trying to build relationships in you know, a broader sense um, and having them feel really comfortable and at home in our space and um, safe there and knowing that, that we, they were in a safe place. And um, once they really started to have all of those needs met 
and started feeling safe within our programming, they started coming to groups, as I said. Um, and this past summer, we were able to go to the Montana Two-Spirit Society gathering and um, that happens every year. And then on top of that, the International Two-Spirit Gathering was happening in the same space, um, which was an incredible experience because they were able to connect to other folks their age, but also to the elders in their community from their own tribal communities. And that's pretty rare for a lot of Two-Spirit kids like you know, if they're um, feeling unsafe uh, on the reservation where they live, they might go to a city and then try to find connection there and not meet a lot of other people um, that they really share a similar story with. But this youth in, in particular met folks from their home in Oklahoma. They stayed connected over these past seven months. And in that time, um, you know, I really saw this youth stepping into their community role. Um, something that they expressed they hadn't been a part of or really thought of since they left home because they didn't really have community. And uh, more than just connecting with youth their age, they really connected with our younger kids, with our elders. They really um, stepped into um, viewing their own gifts as sacred. Um, and while we, were, while we were at the gathering last summer, um, you could really see that they were always out and about helping people, taking food to elders, helping kids with um, art projects or within the workshops that we were at. And they were recognized by that organizing committee and given the Youth Spirit Award for the way that they built community in that space, which really, you know, took them aback and they were shocked by. But we all saw it, you know, their gifts are, were evident and um, they were finally able to feel free enough to express those. So last weekend, actually, we went to San Francisco for the Two-Spirit powwow. And while there, they were able to connect with their Oklahoma family that they met at the gathering last summer. And in that connection, you know, they went down and I could see them from the stands and they looked really happy and they came back up in tears and were given a full regalia and the family said, you know, we're going to welcome you into the powwow circle this afternoon. We're going to have a giveaway and we're going to give you um, elders to guide, to guide you and to, and to direct you um, in this space and in our community. And it was so touching and special watching and, and witnessing, you know, this young person go from somebody that was... Um, unstable and seeking seeking a connection and able to you know step through um, having their needs met all the way to finding community and connection and experiencing being welcomed into the power circle and something that they said on the way home is my family wouldn't do this for me because they knew that I was different and they didn't think that I deserved it and so they left before they were ever you know they ever had the opportunity for something like this and it's it's rare and it's special and to to know that you've built programming in a way that your youth can connect not just to themselves but to culture and community is really special and so i just wanted to share that as an example of um, really meeting our youth's needs as they as we're trying to get them to this space of self-actualization um, in about a month this young person is going to be on a youth panel for the city of Portland on the Trans Day of Visibility and speaking to our city about, you know, their experience as a young person navigating houselessness and how they found their path, which feels very significant from where they were a year and a half ago. Um, That's amazing. Next, Sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and the next bit I just really wanted to talk about how um, to become an ally. If we're starting from, you know, base level of like, I'm not really sure how to step into this role for Two-Spirit Youth, but really wanting to. So what are some things that we can do um, for ourselves? That, that internal work is really important. So suspending judgments, and we all have them from different places, whether it's society, religion, however we grew up, and really suspending that so you can start to learn and seek knowledge in order to educate yourself. And so some of the things that are really important for us to do as educators is learning the language of gender identities and sexual identities. I think sometimes it can be um, 
it can be hard to learn those things and, and a bit confusing, but um, I share resources with, with um, my parents and my parents-in-law on a level, on the same level as what we teach you, uh, kids. And um, some of those things would be um, a video series called Queer Kids Stuff. I think we've listed it later on, but um, that's something that, you know, just getting that base level of language is so important because a lot of isolated, you know, kids that are isolated in small communities may not even know the language. And so they don't know how to identify themselves. Um, finding stories of um, individuals to build your empathy and your compassion so there are lots of documentary series out there. Um, the health board put one together called There's Heart Here, which is quite touching. And again, you know, um, I was in that documentary with another um, person, Lane. And in the process of Lane's doctor seeing the documentary and experiencing um, their journey, Lane was able to access the medicine that they need to transition. And that wouldn't have happened without you know, their doctor seeing this documentary and, and another really special connection of, of them really seeing Lane for who she is and seeing her story and, and having that empathy and compassion for her. Um, there's also, you know, there's lots of documentaries available out there. Um, Decolonize Love, Fire Song, there's podcasts. All My Relations has a really beautiful podcast um, about, uh, you know, that really highlights two-spirit people. Mm -hmm. Um, there's also one called Gender Reveal with individual stories where folks talk about what their identity is and what that really means to them because it could, you know, once you learn that language, now if we can connect it to people and, and really what people think about their identity is really important because everyone has a different perspective. Um, there's also trainings and workshops locally and online that you can seek out for yourself that are typically free. Aorta is a wonderful organization. I, I go to their trainings quite a bit. Um, and they've also helped me as an Indigenous person. They provide free trainings to our community, and they've helped me um, develop my own trainings. Um, the Montana Two-Spirit Society has a wonderful training that came in and educated our entire community and has really helped us move the work forward, as well as the Family Acceptance Project. So those are some internal things that you can do for yourself. And then as you move through that, there's the external work. There is becoming an accomplice for systemic change. Like how do we, what do we then do with the responsibility of that information? So um, some examples are attending a PFLAG meeting, getting to know other people that are also supporting Two-Spirit and Digi-Queer folks. Um, there are, there's the texting resource through the health board, which is really wonderful. Um, just a funny side note is that Typically, when I'm at family gatherings, I will take people's phones and text Ally to the number so that my, my relatives can learn this information. And, you know, at, at first, my mom was like, what are, I'm getting all these text messages. And I said, well, did you click on the links? And my mom is starting to learn more. She is supportive. She is an ally. But this is a way to help her really step into that accomplice role and help me navigate my entire family system with information. Um, there's that Queer Kids video series, which is quite gorgeous. It's like a Sesame Street um, for the LGBTQ community and really teaching language, um, creating visibility in safer spaces, um, interrupting homophobia and transphobia, very important for our community. Using pr uh, pronouns proactively allows folks that are non-binary like myself or they're trans um, feel safe to also use our pronouns and know that our pronouns will be respected. Um, and, you know, just the systemic change piece, there's the Tribal Equity Toolkit, which is a really beautiful toolkit for tribal communities specifically, because when we're doing this work of systemic change, it's not just our organization, but it it's also, um, could also be our um, local sovereign governments that we also um, want to do this work in. And the Indigenizing Love Toolkit, another really wonderful one that uh, my staff and I have gone through together in order for us to teach it to our young folks. So I just wanted to highlight those things. Um, thank you. Sorry, I, I don't mean to be pushing. <laughs> I feel like I'm advancing the slides on you. <laughs> um, but just real quick, um, we talked about community readiness. Um, so we have, if you've left your email address, um, we can get this out to folks. 
um, but this is a quick guide that includes a survey and how to interpret those results um, to kind of gauge where your community um, is at. And then another great resource, um, and we'll put this all in a resource handout for folks as well too, um, but the Indigenizing Plus Love Toolkit as well. Big props there. And we will move on to level one, just getting started with Bridget. Thank you, Mick. <laughs> all right, um, hello everybody. Um, again, my name is Bridget Valenzuela with the Basquiaki Tribe. And, um, you know, Part of um, part of what is being presented today is to really try to reflect upon where we're at with uh, whether you're in a school setting or um, a behavioral health service or an agency or but um, one of the first ways to kind of figure out or to look at where your organization is at is whether or not um, you know we have visibility and acceptance and as Mick said there's the the piece where we want to have allies and and move on towards being more of the accomplice but um if you find that you have very little or none of the posters or pins or any of that to help support um and and move towards being um having acceptance that that's key where there's different resources um, that you can place on bulletin boards, but really it, you want to have something visible, whether or not um, it's in a you know high traffic area, a, a space that's for staff or for, for the student body, but we really want to have an area where we can see things such, you know, various posters that have been I, I think strategically created by the Healthy Native Youth Campaign, but also pins or, or stickers. And, um, you know, in, in, in the facility I work in, we do have uh, in a few areas where we have a lot of youth in our prevention area. We do have the gender unicorn there and um, a couple of uh, individuals that are familiar with this. And it's, it's, it's out there even though it may not have uh, may not be a big talking point. The fact is that it's visible. And um, moving on, if you are with adults or um, in offices or in clinicians or counselors or, or anyone, just having the the safe zone or a safe space emblem can be a very big comforting visual that you're in a place that is supportive. You're um, not necessarily um, at the level where you're the accomplice level, but you can be an ally and have, and be a little bit, you know, silent about it. Not, not necessarily, um, depending on the environment that you're in, but just there are allies there that, that are kind of, they work behind the scenes. Um, they're advocates and they're aware and it may be tough to navigate in, in, in various environments, but those, those silent allies are, are pieces that we can accumulate to where eventually we can move beyond this level one, um, stage and uh if we take a look at along with uh the the posters on this next slide there's a really nice this i remember seeing this particular poster um at one of the at a, at a conference that i had attended my first year working within behavioral health and prevention and, and youth services and um you know the lgbtq loved and accepted poster that Thrive put, puts out. Those are free materials. Um, I think on, on another slide, uh, Morgan, we, we've got an area where you can order these, but for this level one phase, you know, getting information out into the hands of individuals is, is very important. Um, having any sort of training um, that is possible with cultural 
uh, humility, uh, cultural humility trainings, cultural competency, um, diversity, uh, having guest speakers like individuals from the community, past students that have navigated the waters that their that students may find themselves in, and, and two spirit elders, and it's really something that there's there's definitely. Um, a, a need for that, but just having trainings for not just the youth, but just also for the staff involved, for those individuals, the, the, the adults, the individuals that are there guiding the youth within the different programs or scenarios or environments that we're at. And um, I think the uh, next slide shows some of the visuals that can be displayed um, to help build up to being able to provide more services and and, and again this this particular level le particular level is where you might find yourself in an area that you know there's a need for services there's a need for visibility but it may not be there not not just yet and it's kind of like you know we want to start going down that road to where we can help all youth and um just having these visible in areas that, that will be seen as is part of that getting to that and um the um trans student educational resources uh program organization they they have some amazing infographics and they're going to be listed in the resource uh, book but or the resource handout later but on this these these two next uh, infographic posters are, are pretty um, you know why why we need the visibility why we need the support and why things matter and um, you know protective factors for indigenous children include the visibility, the language and the culture and, and connection to land. So, um, you know, we want to be able to provide reason for why we are doing things and why these, these issues are of importance. And this is kind of like the, uh, you know, aside from being good, good people and, and, and heart and, and mind and, and have a good heart, these are some of the you know, the more quantitative points or facts or things to support that. And um, I think uh, I think there's gonna be several other resources listed in the handout regarding the um, Trans Student Union, Trans Student Educational Resources. Thank you, Bridget. <laughs> and you know, I just wanted to make one quick mention uh, before the the being a, a silent ally is probably where you will find more of the support within a level one organization and and once you do have individuals that are able to help youth you you kind of realize the big need and, and it's something that i think that i experienced uh this summer taking a group of youth to the thrive conference in portland where I didn't realize the the amount of exposure that was going to uh, it was going to have in terms of being able to see um, a very inclusive community and have things be somewhat just normalized in from compared to the world that we live in, which is very um, conservative and our culture is very infused with um, religious um, teachings and whatnot. So it, it was a big eye opener. And, um, you know, you don't have to, uh, you know, eventually we'd like to see things progress, but it really enforces the, the need to have those allies for the youth that, you know, if, it's almost like if you don't do it, then who? So whether you're behind the scenes or not, it's something that I really can see how it made a big impact on a couple of kids this summer. So, go quiet allies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
All right. Uh, thank you, Bridget. Uh, we will pass it on to Morgan and she will lead us through level two. We're getting there. Wait, oh, Amanda, let me give you the remote. Sorry. Um, and I'll answer while Amanda's giving me control over her screen. Um, it looks like we have a question from Katie about the best media or gear for allies. Um, so I think that the pronoun buttons and pins that were photo, uh, that there was a photograph of a few slides ago are great for allies to wear. Um, and those are available from the Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board for free. Um, just send me an email. My email is right there on the slide and will also be on the resource sheet. And we also have pamphlets and rat cards that are ally specific if you're looking for more educational materials to share with other allies. Um, and so again, all of that stuff is available for you free of charge from the board. Um, so I think Bridget did a great job of walking us through um, how to move a community from a place where there's very little two-spirit LGBTQ visibility to a place where um, people are more visible, where we're seeing posters on the walls, where we're having a few initial trainings about two-spirit and LGBTQ identities. Um, and so I am now going to walk us through sort of the next level. So level two, um, this is a community in which there is already visibility. Um, and so it's clear that there are youth and adults who both identify as Two-Spirit LGBTQ. And it's also clear that there are allies. Um, so young people who are Two-Spirit or LGBTQ in these communities know what adults to turn to if they need one-on-one -on -one support or mentoring or if they have questions. In these communities, there have already been a few trainings about like an introduction to sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, so people have the basic language that they need to start having these conversations. Um, and also, if something happens in a community like this or a school that's at this level uh, that is unaffirming or problematic, like if something's said that's transphobic or homophobic, um, there are adults present who feel like they have the knowledge and skills to step in and correct that behavior. So youth have uh, adult allies that can help them in that, in that way. When I think about things that are still needed in a level two community, I think centrally about connection and about infrastructural support. Uh, when I say connection, I mean that youth in these communities might still feel like they are the only person in their school who is two-spirit or LGBTQ, or um, they might have more complicated questions about medical and social transition or healthy sexuality that they don't quite know who to ask. Um, and then infrastructural support is also potentially lacking. So while there are adults available who identify as allies and who want to help these youth, um, the systems that are put in place within this community, whether that's with regard to um, sports or bathrooms or other things, aren't really quite set up yet to be inclusive for Two-Spirit LGBTQ youth. And so I see this centrally as a uh, tension between pride on the one hand, visibility on the one hand, and still within infrastructures and systems, a sort of focus on a binary idea about gender, um, such that that pride and inclusivity and visibility can't really disseminate itself across the community as a whole. So we'll talk now about a few really practical strategies that can move a community from this place where uh, we're getting there up to the level three celebrating community that Renee will talk about after I'm done. When I think about connection, I think about support groups um, and support groups both for two-spirit LGBTQ youth and also for allies. Um, research has shown that having gender sexuality alliances in schools, groups where two-spirit LGBTQ youth and allies can come together and talk and eat food and support each other, um, are incredibly key for youth. They not only improve the perception of school safety for Two-Spirit and LGBTQ youth, they also um, like buffer the negative effects of teasing or bullying such that um, even if youth experience teasing and bullying, they still have a really high level of well-being in schools with a strong gender sexuality alliance. Renee is going to also talk a little bit later about a native specific gender sexuality alliance, the Two-Spirit Safe Space Alliance at NEA, um, which Mick mentioned earlier. So I'll leave that for Renee to discuss how um, fun and exciting these 
alliances can be, uh, but I'll just say here that it doesn't take a lot to start one of these. A gender sexuality alliance can be as simple as one faculty member and a couple youth who identify getting together once a month to talk about things and support each other. Like it can be as simple as that. Um, and then I also think about support groups for allies, which is really important. Uh, PFLAG is of course the gold standard here. Um, and uh, Sheila Lopez down in Phoenix created a native PFLAG chapter, uh, which has done really wonderful work and is actually putting on the second Two-Spirit Pow Wow in just a few weeks on February 29th. Um, and again, this can be really simple, just a few adults who are interested in um, coming together and talking about supporting their youth who meet up once a month over coffee. It doesn't need to be terribly complicated. All right. Am I still controlling? Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> oh, there we go. OK. Um, when I think about infrastructural support, I think about um, two things. First, buildings. Uh, within buildings, I think really the key thing, the thing that's important is to have access to gender neutral restrooms. It's really important that these restrooms be accessible. So it's not like, yeah, there's one in the building. It's on the fifth floor in, a, in the corner, right? And um, they need to be right there and accessible for youth. Um, and they need to be safe. And I want to make it clear here that having a gender neutral restroom in your building doesn't mean you need to knock out walls and redo plumbing. Like it does not need to be that intense. Um, it's really can just be changing a sign. Um, you can order a sign for a gender neutral restroom for $20 online. I've done it. It comes complete with the tack that you need to like put it up on the wall. So all you have to do is take it out of the packaging, put the tacky stuff on the back, slap it on the wall, boom, you've got a gender neutral restroom. This is especially true if your building has a single stall restroom. Um, it's just, it's very, very easy in that instance to create a gender neutral restroom and to greatly improve the safety and quality of life for any two-spirit or LGBTQ young person in your school. Um, if you have a multi-user restroom, you can do the same thing. You'll see the image right there of signs that have um, restroom with urinals, restroom without urinals. And this can work really well because in this case, uh, a person can use the restroom that corresponds with their gender identity, but also a cisgender person who wants to be able to choose, for instance, not to walk into a restroom with urinals has that choice and has the knowledge that they need to make that choice. So it's a safe and comfortable option for everyone. And then I'll just point out um, here a sign that the students at the Native American Youth and Family Center in Portland created for their gender neutral restroom. Um, if we talk about gatherings and events, there are a few key things you can do to make them more inclusive for Two-Spirit LGBTQ youth. Um, the first thing is to just always introduce yourself with your name and pronouns. So my name is Morgan, I use they, them pronouns. Setting up that example creates a space for all Two-Spirit and LGBTQ youth and faculty members um, to disclose their pronouns and to be gendered properly. And then there are a few key places in which Two-Spirit and LGBTQ young people might feel especially um, left out of school curricula. And the first of those is uh, within sexual education curricula. Um, I wish that I had a gold star inclusive curriculum that I could offer you to improve this. I think that many of the Healthy Native Youth curricula do have at least certain sections that are inclusive for Two-Spirit and LGBTQ individuals, so those can be a good option. There's also a SMART curriculum that is specific for cis young men who are having sex with other cis young men. Um, so that can be a good curriculum specifically for that population. Um, and Planned Parenthood also has a SOGI curriculum called Included um, that does a decent job of creating uh, space for Two-Spirit LGBTQ identities within sex education. It's just really, really important that Two-Spirit LGBTQ young people have curricula that cause them to feel affirmed and to know what to do to have um, safe sex. And then last, within sports, um, I think that this is a place where often Two-Spirit and LGBTQ individuals, especially those with minority gender identities, don't feel particularly able to um, be included. So to the extent that your um, sports activities and events can be co-ed or gender neutral, that is really, really wonderful. And if they can't be, just ensuring that all students feel safe and comfortable joining whichever team aligns with their gender identity is really, really important. All right, um, if you want, whoops, I went too far. Um, you can text LGBTQ2S to 
9779 uh, to stay updated with the work that the board is doing um, and also just for more opportunities. Thank you. Thank you, Morgan. <laughs> and I'm sorry, I think I used a wrong pronoun on you. All good. We're practicing. <laughs> we are. Okay, so we will pass it on to Renee, who will take us through level three. Let's celebrate. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everyone. <laughs> so, how to be supportive, welcoming, and an ally within your agency and school. So creating awareness and safe spaces for youth and families. And as you can see here, um, when you first enter the NEA Family Center, I created um, this visual so that when families and youth came in, you can see prior to colonization and where we're at now, where our two-spirit LGBTQ peoples are at, trans, excuse me, people are at. So we, um, I created this last year um, to bring awareness and to make it feel more welcoming for our students and youth. We have 75 students in our Many Nations Academy. Um, out of the 75, I have about 20 students that identify. So um, when we created these visuals, uh, we noticed that more and more youth are coming out to us as staff and to youth advocates. And our youngest is nine years old that we serve. So um, just to let you, go, let you guys all know how important it is to have um, visuals within your agencies, within your schools, your classrooms, to create that awareness, that comfort, but also those resources uh, for our youth. You can go ahead and change the, the slide now. Um, here you see um, within the Many Nations Academy School at NEA Family Center, we have instructors. We have six instructors. Um, including myself, and within our classrooms, we utilize a lot of our uh, resources that we um, gather from other organizations or within ourselves, you know, within our organizations, and to provide, um, to provide, you know, prevention work, and also to uh, promote um, other students to feel comfortable to come out if they need to, or if they need resources or families. So you can see um, the two classrooms here, and then the third the third picture is our staff room. So not only do the faculties have their room um, with visuals and um, with information, the staff as well. So um, part of, you can go ahead and slide to the next slide. Okay, and here you see um, several of our Two-Spirit Youth um, at a conference here tabling. So um, part of our um, mission was to provide um, safe spaces for our youth um, and opportunities. Uh, we started um, engaging our youth and um, exposing them to GSA conferences within the Portland community. Also, um, inviting other um, ally healthcare groups and organizations to speak and provide workshops within our student leadership club, the Two Spirit Safe Space Alliance. We also um, encourage um, a lot of the community um, organizations to allow um, other LGBTQ groups to come and do tabling. Uh, we come in as well uh, to provide resources for families. Um, especially during the back to school events that are held within other schools or agencies. It's important that families and youth know that there's resources out there for them, whether it's, you know, engaging in student leadership, healthcare, um, where do I go for, um, you know, clothing resources. It's important to have those organizations table at your events. Um, I would encourage, you know, maybe meeting with the powwow, um, committee and asking them, you know, would it be okay if we can table or provide resources for our youth and for our families? Um, also, um, maybe um, encouraging, you know, non-binary categories like exhibitions, you know, giving our youth and young adults opportunities to participate in that category without being reprimanded as well. So we have done that also. Um, Within um, our Safe Space to Spirit Alliance, um, our youth, we have about 23 youth that are engaging in our club. We first started two years ago with five, 
And since then, we have increased our numbers. I've noticed that a lot of the kids are coming to school consecutively. Their grades have increased and they're getting the support they need. Um, I have um, also parents asking for information and that's, you know, that shows progress there on how they can support their child. So again, uh, you know, asking, you know, school administration or asking your, you know, staff, you know, management, is it possible that we can have an all staff training because you know, we serve two spirit youth here and um, how do I go about working with our youth? You know, some of our staff are still uncomfortable using pronouns, but having these all staff trainings and faculty trainings does, you know, does help, you know, working with youth and with our families and kids. So, you know, it doesn't hurt to invite people from the Montana Two-Spirit Society to come in and do an hour workshop with, you know, the staff and faculty. Um, I'm going to let Mick go ahead and take over. You can go ahead and go to the next slide as well. Oh yeah, that we provided t-shirts for the kids too. So um, these are some of the activities um, that were created for our youth and our community so that, you know, we see a healthy community building and engagement sessions here with our kids. So the Safe Space Alliance to Spirit, that logo there, you see that rainbow logo with the, the eagle, the kids came up with that logo, our students. And so I work around our students' schedule. As you can see, I don't work around my schedule because I want them to be able to participate and have access to these meetings. So I make sure that I work with the school um, administration so that the kids have access and I provide you know, lunches and meals for them. And for our Two-Spirit Prom, that prom was open not only to our native community, but to the whole community in Portland. So we had about 350 kids that participated. And we worked with other organizations for like a co-sponsorship. So you might not have a budget, but other people might have money where they can co-sponsor these events for your community or for your children. So always look out to reaching out to other groups for support as well. And then the planning itself, that was all student led. So the kids decided on their theme, they decided what they wanted to eat, you know, they decided on the DJ and the photography. So all that was student led as well. You can go to the next slide. And then engaging in having our kids participate in uh, community events, civic events as well. So here, this is last year at Pride, Portland Pride. Some of the teachers were there, including our executive director, Paul was there. And um, you see some of our NAEA volunteers as well with our youth, um, getting the kids engaged. And we also tabled at Pride and that's how we're able to bring awareness, but also reach out to other community members that just moved here to Portland and have no idea where to go for resources and seeing our visibility, they were able to approach us and we were able to engage with them and then give them those resources. So all the participants from Pride that came to our table are now getting resources through NIA Family Center. So you can go to the next slide. And that's it. So thank you guys. And I think Mick's gonna have add on to that as well. Mick said, I'm taking over. <laughs> Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. And all it took it wasn't so hard, you guys. All it took was just reserving a, one of the office spaces in the school, you know, a classroom, putting that, you know, how you reserve on your guys's uh, help desk. Just doing that reservation, ordering pizza, you know, asking my boss, "Is there any funds where I can buy some food?" And that's how we started. And then the kids, you know, we fundraise and then just reaching out to other groups for donations or partnerships. It doesn't take very much to create an activity or an event for Two-Spirit LGBTQ you know, youth. So that's how we started. So I think Mix needs to come on the next one. I love all these examples and I love the visuals. And I'm so glad that you all are resources that folks can reach out to. Um, we have everyone's email address listed um, and we'll share that um, after the call as well. Um, but just to um, let folks know, we're putting together a resource document. So this little snapshot here, we've still got to fill a few spaces in here. Um, but we've broken that down into documentaries, podcasts, social media channels, tech mes text messaging, uh, trainings, materials, uh, terminology links, and then free print materials. Um, so we'll send that out after the discussion. But we have a few minutes if anybody would like to unmute their line or if you would like to use the chat box um, to open up a conversation. <laughs> and 
And I will go, um, Katie, it looks like there's some chat about sex positive families. And it looks like there is a few um, thumbs up from Nicole and Morgan. Um, so I don't know if either of you wanted to talk about um, that resource or if you wanted to provide anything else or if Katie wanted to follow up. a little bit about uh, sex positive families. So uh, this is Nicole, everyone. And uh, I work really closely with Melissa, who is the founder and, and the person uh, behind sex positive families. Oh, I think she's frozen. <laughs> Mine was starting to mess up. That too. she puts oh, out that Am I back? You're back. <laughs> okay, good. I was just saying that they have a lot of great resources specifically geared towards families, which is not um, always easy to find, and, and I've found them to be really helpful. Good fact sheets. Yeah, great fact sheets, great resources, excellent social media. <laughs> awesome. And in that resource doc, um, Mick has a lot of really great like Instagram and lots of social media channels to share too. So we'll share that with folks as well. Okay, well, if you're thinking of questions, oh, uh, Katie, yes, you can unmute your line and I'll find you too. There we go, I think you're unmuted. Okay, hi, thank you everyone. I'm curious, I um, have the opportunity to bring some of these materials to other groups that I work with in Oregon, to trainings and presentations. And I would really value input around how to present the materials to folks who are probably on a wide spectrum of familiarity with these topics in a way that um, is most likely to be engaging for where they're at. Um, and these would be generally folks working um, with young people that I work in the field of early psychosis intervention. Um, so they're working with youth already, um, but I'm, I think that this area is, I'm sure, a uh, room for growth and I want to present it in the best way possible um, to get us going. Thank you. Yeah, I can jump in and then I hope others will jump in as well. Um, Katie, I think that if you're able to sort of uh, stratify the different communities into one of these sort of levels of readiness that we've discussed, that can really help you think about how to present the resources. Um, if you are working with one presentation and you feel like your audience has a wide variety of backgrounds and context, um, I think in that case, uh, for me, the most effective way to pre present these resources has been to begin with, uh, for instance, there's Heart Here, the documentary that Mick mentioned, or another resource that is really story-based and narrative-based. Um, and I think that that tends to elicit uh, motivation, sympathy, and empathy on the part of the audience, uh, which gets everyone at least on some level of uh, the same page. And then I think that, at least with regard to the resources for allies and providers from the board, um, those are designed to be accessible for people who don't have any background in um, like Two-Spirit LGBTQ uh, health care or um, allyship. And so they, they should be able to access those things and then also to go more deeply into them if they need. Um, and then just one thing is I would suggest not overwhelming folks with terminology right off the bat. Um, just from my experience, that has tended to frustrate and um, potentially turn people away. That's my two cents. Thanks so much. And I think to speak to that, Mick and I chatted a little bit beforehand, and I think um, to Morgan's point, interweaving those personal stories throughout really is what we tried to do here as well. But I think that has an impact on folks and it makes the content more accessible. Um, 
that's my two cents. <laughs> Can I say something, Amanda? Yeah. Like when I have like SMERT come in and facilitate some talking sessions or workshops with the kids, they usually bring visuals or like brochures or information and I just house those up front when the community comes in through our doors because we do provide social services as well. So just having them right there up front where people can access them and then having them within, you know, our classrooms and the school office, you know, just having it there where parents can pick one up or students, you know, they can be discreetly too, you know, some people might want to do it, you know, discreetly. So just having it out there for them too. Awesome. And it looks like Mick has provided um, a resource as well. How do you say that? Chem, chem for shop? <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, it's ka info shop so it's really it's a um, it's a instagram page that's based in Dineton, the navajo nation and they provide resources to the community to learn about gender spectrum um, from a cultural perspective and so they bring in elders to teach that work to the community and it's really wonderful if you're based there and they do have a Facebook page and they live stream a lot of their workshops. We can add that to our resources page as well. Awesome. Well, I will encourage folks to continue to type in the chat feed as well. And if there are any questions that we don't get to, we'll make sure to follow up after um, the call. But why we're here. So just in case, if you haven't been to the Healthy Native Youth website, please do. Um, you can find curricula and resources there. The community of practice uh, recorded sessions as well as all the handouts are under this resources and support tab. And of course, our social media channels. Um, so we have our Facebook, Instagram um, accounts. If you would like to be up with the latest, please check those out. And if you're tabling any events or if you would like to help uh, promote Healthy Native Youth, um, just let us know. We'll be happy to send um, business cards, folders. I think we've got like post-it notes, lots of swag that you can share with folks. And our next call, uh, March 11th, is supporting youth experiencing trauma in the classroom and beyond. And we have a couple of really great presenters lined up from the National Native Children's Trauma Center. Um, just thinking about the best ways that we can support Native youth um, experiencing trauma. And our lineup for the rest of this year is here. And just a, a small note here, I think we may expand this uh, human trafficking and missing and murdered indigenous uh, relatives, possibly into two um, calls. So just uh, letting you know there. And of course, if you have any questions, you can email me. Um, and a shout out to our funders, Indian Health Service, um, HIV and Behavioral Health Programs, as well as the Secretary's Minority AIDS Initiative Fund. Um, but that is that. I think I will leave it there. Um, a huge thank you, huge thank you to our guest speakers. Um, they put so much time into this presentation and you can really tell with how fluid everything was. Um, so really appreciate uh, you all being on the call. And thank you, everyone else. <laughs> thank you.